Welcome to this first webinar hosted by Art B on the occasion of the Part A Part Exhibition, uh, which is curated by Lorette de Jager. Um, I want just first of all to say hello, Lorette. How are you? Hello, Gwen. I'm well, thank you. Um, Monique de Deville. Hi there. Hi. Uh, Eddie. Good to see you, Karstens. Hi, Gwen. Hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, gentlemen, last, Herman Nieber. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello. <laughs> and thank you to Warren, who handles all our complex, um, our uh, very complex technology for us. We thank you very much. So I'm Gwen Miller, and I'm one of the 20 artists participating in this event. Um, this exhibition. Um, I'm a part-time artist, to put it that way, because I'm also an academic. I'm a lecturer at Genesa, and um, it's here where I completed my D in, in intermediality, um, and it links very much with my, with my master's. So there's interest in the sublime, which is the main topic of this uh, session, of this exhibition, comes quite a long way for me from the 90s. And obviously there's been a lot of changes through time, uh, critical changes. There's been uh, multiple conversations in environmentalism, ethics of post-humanism and everyday culture. <coughs> Sorry, that's my dog. Oh, <laughs> she, she might join the conversation now and then. If she bugs us too much, I'll chase her away. Um, so um, it's a very large field, uh, the notion of the sublime. So we'll really, in our conversation, have an informal conversation and, and speak to the works of the artists um, to really uh, make this quite obscure, complex uh, concept a little bit more relevant for, for uh, the everyday and for... Um, for a sense of transparency. I'm very honored to facilitate the webinar for uh, Lorette and for Art B Gallery. And uh, I think I know for, for Art B, it's also the very first experience of a webinar. We're going to try to keep this discussion within an hour. Um, okay, and we will also speak as artists and practitioners. So we're a group of people here that's, that's um, that really involved with the materiality of making art. Um, and our aim is a broad aim to make this, this concept accessible to listeners and to viewers. I want to start by introducing Lorette. Um, Lorette, uh, who has, this is your curator, curatorial debut. Lorette uh, had her first training in uh, jewelry design and manufacture and later on then completed, or very recently completed uh, masters in, in visual art. And um, very timely received a fabulous certificate from Lada yesterday. Congratulations, Lorette, with that. Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> uh, you'll have to celebrate in, in isolation and, and, and do the whole performance and give us photographs. <laughs> okay. So your research and your focus was on dystopian theory and um, and your MBA exhibition, um, Poetry of Decay, was exhibited in the in Cape Town. I would like you to give us a background on, on why you decided to venture into curation and specifically uh, why this exhibition. Thank you, Gwen. I just want to say uh, good morning, participants and listeners. Um, well, yes, Gwen, I was, um, I joined the Art B com uh, committee earlier this year in March, and uh, the seed for this exhibition was actually, actually came from a committee meeting we had in the midst of lockdown. Like many other galleries out there, we had to think innovatively when the world went into lockdown. And we are fortunate enough to have a wonderful web designer on our committee, who's also facilitating the technical side here today. And largely thanks to Warren, we managed to um, put on two very successful online exhibitions during lockdown. 
so the discussion veered to what are we going to do once rest restrictions were eased and we could actually host an exhibition in the physical space. And during that meeting, we chatted about lockdown art and pandemic art, but as a committee, we felt that we've basically overdosed on lockdown art on social media and online platforms over the past, I think it was by then five months. Um, and during the discussion, I, th I thought, uh, why don't we focus on the human condition? Why don't we look at what happens psychologically when people are forced to exist apart? And that's also where the title comes from, that all, even though we are apart, we are still a part of the greater whole. So I waxed lyrical for a minute or two <laughs> on the Zoom meeting and wasn't present at the next meeting. I went to visit my, visit my dad in the Karoo, no internet connection, came back, read the minutes and realized that my proposal was accepted. <laughs> so that is the deep end. <laughs> So the idea is that um, I, I wanted to focus on the longing and the reflection and the horror of living social distant lives. As artists, we universally create in isolation. Solitude provides rich and fertile soil for creation. and We are no strangers to it. But what became apparent to me during those five, four, first months in isolation where I basically only had access to Instagram and online exhibitions was a trend, a thematic trend in the content of the art shown on social media. And although hashtag lockdown art accompanied almost every post or exhibition, there emerged for me a definite manifestation of the longing of the human psyche for connection. Within this pandemic zeitgeist, if you will, three universal themes emerged as indicators where the human soul searches for connection. Thank you. Can you, um, can you maybe tell us a bit more about these, these specific themes, um, your reasons for grouping specific artists? Um, it'd be interesting, like if we chat to artists, whether they feel at home in those categories. Um, but also explain to us something about these heavy words of sublime and abject, etc. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Gwen. Um, the themes, the sublime, the abject and the mundane are reflected in the works created by these selected artists. And these are the three themes that I saw emerge during lockdown. Um, we see a reflection of the human condition as it manifests when connections are stretched and severed and possibly even tempor temporarily suspended. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll discuss each theme individually, showing you some images from the exhibition for those that have not necessarily had a chance to view it yet. If you would just allow me to share my screen. There we go. Is that, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so first we have the sublime. The sublime is when is it beauty that evokes terror. Whereas the beauty in the mundane is a consolatory and even soothing in its familiarity, the greatness of the sublime. Last evokes... chance for a minute, right? Oh, let me see. Um, I can hear you, Lorette. So no. Okay. I think it's on Gwen's uh, side, maybe. Okay. Uh, I don't know if the others have lost sound, but I have lost sound for a moment. Um, I, can hear you. I can hear you guys. Okay, I'm okay. just going to continue. So, <laughs> um, sorry, yes. Okay, so it's a purification of being devoured by something greater and more boundless than mere beauty. I have found among the works that were created during the pandemic a resurgence in the sublime, not necessarily the, the yearning, the transcendentalist yearning to return to nature, but being consumed by the sublimity of nature. The works selected are thematically beyond mere reproductions of beautiful landscapes and idyllic beauty. Uh, what I search for was works that evoke a sense of overwhelming greatness, a beauty that not only terrifies, but leaves the viewer in the grips of Stendhal syndrome. 
I just want to, um, there we go. That's another view of the installation. If we look at the work of Harman Niebuhr on the right there, um, his work evokes an overwhelming sense of loss. It's the combination, to me, it's a combination of the, sub the sublimity um, of nature combined with destruction. Uh, sorry. Uh, it reminds us of the devastating influence the humans ha the man human have on the natural world. Paula Lowe's work, these magnificent trees, speak to the sublime both through their process and their iconography. Uh, Paula uses glass negatives dating back to 1929, through, into which she scratches negative images. And this process lends weight and a sense of time and history and mystery to her works, with that, which also translates to the sublime. As with Paula's work, uh, the work of Ilse and Niemann, these exquisite paper cuts show a very strong vertical composition, which evokes a sense of humanity's need for vertical relationship as opposed to the horizontal relationships of the mundane. But perhaps more importantly for me, the sublime translates through her process. The very thought of Ilse spending a hundred hours painstakingly cutting these images from paper leaves me completely overwhelmed. <laughs> the selection of images to resist traditional landscape and nature paintings and focuses on the psychological response to being consumed by greatness. Unfortunately, I don't have time to look at all the participating artists' um, interpretation of the sublime, but the works of Veronica Reed, Susanne Grindling, Stian Bum, Monique de Waal, Aidy Katia Carstens, and yours, Gwen, all speak to the sublime in their own particular evocative manner. Just, okay, now we go to the abject. The pandemic conjured up images of death and destruction. In the works of Bosch and Briegel the Elder and more recently, Bajarnovich, these artists all grappled with our finitude, but mostly with death on a grand scale. The artists working during the pandemic turned to the object as a means of making less, uh, sorry, making sense of horror on a global, the horror of death on a global scale. Apologies. <laughs> um, during the months of isolation, social media feeds were flooded with masked figures. I know the medieval plague mask became a fast favorite, as well as gas masks, and then also obviously our surgical mask, which has by now become such a part of all of us that it almost feels like a second skin. For a part, a part however, the selection refrains refrains from showing literal masked figures and concentrates on artists who engage with the object in a more symbolic conceptual way. I found a duality in the abject works. If we look at the works behind me physically in the gallery and on the screen at the moment, um, we see a, a, a works that I feel signifies quite accurately how humans respond to times of crises. The work of Marlies Keith, Hanley Taut, and Judy Woodbourne all reveals a dark sense of humor. Utterly at ease within the new social reality, they relieve the tension we feel when confronted with death. Looking at Taut's work in the center, sorry, there we go. Looking at Taut's work, um, we resolve to face death with a good sense of wit. A violent bunch on the left and boohoo on the right, complete with skeletal figures amidst a bunch of exquisitely embroidered flowers on rubber. Hanali's process speaks to viol the violence of death as a non-degradable medium undergo a violent process of change. She juxtaposed the delicate cotton thread with industrial discarded inner tubes. By embroidering those things that can decay, such as flowers and flesh using a degradable material such as cotton thread, 
onto a non-degradable non material such as the rub sorry such as rubber she ruptures those boundaries between life and death Marlise's work, pictured on the left there, addressed the sedative phobia or fear of silence, if not the claustrophobia of isolation. To quote from her artist statement, she says, I wasn't prepared for the immense silence in isolation. In the quiet, I hear the constant keening of souls. I'm not prepared. Her work is obsessive, quirky and colorful relieving the tension we feel when confronted with death. However, moving from these quirky images to the selection of the artist group on the following wall, we realize that this might not all be fun and games. This virus might actually kill us. Here the sublime meets horror of the abject. The reality of death sets in and we experience the permeability of the boundary between life and death. Gwen Miller's Reservoir Triptych, pictured to the right on this photograph, evoked to me such a poignant response when I first saw it on Instagram during lockdown. It stirred up my own experience with death and loss and the unknown. The works of Marika Kleinschild and Monique Day Wild, pictured to the left on this photograph, similarly ties into the tenderness of death which we explore further later. And then lastly, Tian van Dieffinger's series on the Eitgeborbenes deals with abjection on a visceral level. Moving from the abject, we go to the man, oh, sorry, that's Tian's work. I forgot to skip. <laughs> Moving to the mundane. At the very start of lockdown, one predominantly saw images from everyday life. It was as though the artists tried to make sense of their surroundings by painting what they saw, which is ultimately what we as artists tend to do. The mundane reflects a slice of life approach where the artists interpret their immediate daily surroundings. The iconic, icon the iconography is simple. The bread they had for breakfast, family heirlooms, furniture and pillows, everyday objects. There's, sorry, there's a nostalgic element to the mundane, which is especially, um, for, sorry, there's a nostalgic element to the mundane, a longing for simpler times and a yearning for the safe and the familiar. Ingrid Engelbrecht's Nostalgia for the Shared Lunch, pictured here, is a perfect example of the soft, consolatory beauty of the mundane. Similarly, Sunita Hansen's work um, shows, speaks of morning light, more spoolikis, and today's washing. It serves to comfort the viewer. It's reminiscent of the intimism of the 19th and 20th century. These works will serve both now and in times to come as a reminder of the time we spend indoors, confined to the safety of home and family. While Marika Kleinschultz, there we go. While Marika Kleinschultz's Cerulean, although photorealist depiction of something as simple as a bunch of cellophane wrapped sweets, veers towards the sublime in its technique. Although thematically similar, there are a variety of stylistic approaches and media in this section. This work evokes a sense of the material, an affirmation of the only certainty existing right now is to be found in the current moment. The other contributing artists include Stian Bum, Adi Kutsia Carstens, Ilse Niemann, Danal Jordan, Amanda Hayes, and Lisa Mayberg. They all engage with the mundane on a deeply personal yet utterly relatable level. I try to resist idealized, stylized, still life depictions in favor of a slice of life approach. Um, Zareth, that was really, um, really insightful and uh, wonderful to have that overview as a start of our discussion. As you were talking, well, and I'm looking at the other artists, um, each of us sitting in our own studios, it reminds me also of um, 
of that sense of the mundane uh, where we try and make something that is something that is about all and something that is um, about being maybe even more than than the the everyday so um i also think it's wonderful that you fetch the sublime within the romantic roots uh of what we were speaking about um i think one of the things that's interesting for us as artists living today is then also the shift that has taken place within the sublime um you know if i think of 17th century sublime we speak of uh, the how religion has permeated uh, philosophy on the one side um, and that uh, people strove to have a sense of the absolute we think of Friedrich and, and all the great nature painters and I think what today um, you know we, we obviously became critical of a time of uh, hierarchy um, exceptionalism um, domination that that was uh, imminent in the romantic times when the concept of the sublime was defined. Um, what we probably look at more today is, uh, and yeah, I refer to philosophers like uh, Guattari and, and Rosie Boraidotti, uh, a multi-layered predicament of um, environment, social, economic, affective and psychic dimensions, which you've also mentioned. Um, and, and I think a crux of the word that I, I picked up from, from those readings and in your talking through the curation is uh, a certain ecologies of belonging. Um, I see this concept of ecologies of belonging very powerful in um, Hermann Niebuhr's work. Hermann, um, you write about this relationship with Earth and uh, our complicity in, in this geological age um, where human actions had such an influence on, on nature and climate, etc. Can you give us some background um, uh, of your stories of the, of the paintings of birds? I see they titled Anthropocene 1 and 2. Mm. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I think to start with is, is something that, that uh, it struck me when I first heard it, but it was something that Anselm Kiefer, the great German painter said, and, and it's echoed by another painter whose work relates to the series, uh, Luke Timons. But Kiefer basically says, the problem with art is that its language is aesthetic. So when it's starting to make these commentaries about really awful things, and he's referring to sort of German history, you're stuck with the language of aesthetics, the language of beauty, essentially. And that's the great dilemma. So you've got beauty trying to be provocative, evocative, but you're stuck with that. And that is the, the central design of it. Um, and I've always been drawn to that very dilemma. You know, what is the artist's uh, uh, duty? You know, Ruskin spoke of the artist's duty as a duty to delight. Um, the, the great poet Mary Oliver speaks of using art as a, she, she refers to rather using the carrot than the stick. So, so basically having people kind of um, shocked at the beauty that's about to leave in terms of environmental damage or, you know, the earth, uh, the crisis we find ourselves in. So it's, it's, it's almost, so I've taken a cue from that kind of leaning, which is to say, well, can you shock people with sheer beauty? Into, a, into an activist moment of basically understanding that we're living in a, in a, in a time of great calamity for the earth. Um, so that's, that's sort of the backstory. The, the other piece that I think is important just for me to add is it was in 2002 and I walked into the, the Tate Modern and everyone had been sort of speaking about Look Timons' response to 9-11 because he was gonna unveil this painting. And he unveiled this painting, which was hanging there, which was massive. It was five meters by three and a half meters. Mm. And it was the most ordinary, um, simplistic, what he calls the bottom rung of the of, of paintings hierarchy of a still life, of a vase and a thing. And I've got a copy of it, if we could just bring that up, uh, Warren. Um, just this very ordinary image. 
uh, if I don't know if that, there we go. So this this painting now it measures. You've you've sort of got to get the scale of it. It's five meters by um, three and a half meters, and it really overwhelmed you by its scale. And what he's kind of saying is the same thing as Kiefer. He's saying painting just cannot respond to adequately to the crisis of our age. And, and I sort of, I've always been struck by that. So what is it that we're left to do? We can't respond actively, you know. Um, and so what we do is we, we show what, the, what we still have. That's, that's sort of my take on it. And um, so, that, so that's the sort of preamble of how this body of work came to be. Um, <clears throat> I was making a series of paintings, which are essentially landscapes, but just a horizon. Um, so if you could go to the next one, Warren, if you don't mind. So they were, they were essentially very simplistic paintings, kind of uh, very Rothko-esque, small, but very simple, um, just, just uh, 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 lines. Um, and if we could, I don't know if that's, if you can find them, Warren. I've, I've, uh, I've unfortunately gone against the moderator's remit and I've submitted more than one image. So uh, bear with me. Moderator is so, okay. <laughs> so this was, this, was the, this was the start of it. Uh, just go to the one above, please, Warren. I can see your, just that one. So this was the series of paintings. They were essentially just these bands. They were landscape orientated, but they were also, um, a kind of offering a meditative state, um, but essentially using the language of landscape. So if you go to the next one, um, what happens in the next one, which spurred on the, uh, the, the series, um, if that's possible, is, is what happens is the horizon line, sorry, the green one, if you could go one up, the horizon line just has a slight um, arc to it. And I suddenly saw, oh, this is interesting. The paintings are now moving out of, the viewer is now moving back further and further. And we're basically getting the edge of the earth. So then I, then I thought, um, well, let's paint the earth. You know, if that's what it's gonna be, let's paint it. And then the, the next painting comes along. Um, and this painting comes along, this one of the earth that's at the time, sort of late, middle late last year when the Amazon was on fire and there was all the press around that. And it really did, and it, it did sort of um, kind of inject a sense of real urgency and crisis in terms of the implications of that. So the next painting becomes the, the basically the curvature of the earth, which, and what I loved about this one, <clears throat> if we can just get the next one, Warren, Sorry, I'm, I'm issuing instruction from another quarter here. Thank you. So just one up. So this painting is the, <clears throat> it's the curvature of the earth. And it is just that, like Ellsworth Kelly's paintings, it's that curve that's, it's just very beautiful. And I think it has a resonance with us. We just sort of that curve will just resonate with us, you know, something about that is just beautiful. And what, what's nice about this painting is that the rest of the scale is implied. You know, if we were to stitch together the full arc of the earth, you'd have a massive, uh, you know, you'd have a massive painting. Anyway, I then went and I'm sort of, I'm sort of explaining the process just to give you an idea of the artistic process isn't always so um, lofty and high in terms of ideals. It's often very pragmatic and practical. But I saw this painting, and this is a very small painting. I think it measures 20 centimeters by 40. And I thought, let's do a big one of these. So I ordered a canvas, which was two meters by 85, which is the same proportion as this, uh, with every intention of making a massive uh, earth painting. And then, so if you can go to the next one, uh, Warren, if you don't mind. I was driving and happened to come across this lilac breasted roller that had just been killed. And I managed to get a photograph or two of it. And I realized that this little beast is a stand-in for the world. It's the, it's the earth effectively. And, and that sort of led me into this series of paintings, which is that these little creatures that are so delicate and, and um, 
fleeting and already have a, have a uh, I think delicacy is the word to use. If you blow these things up and you make them massive, you kind of amplify the tragedy and you amplify the, I don't know, the scale of the loss, the scale of the sadness, the scale of, so this regal little creature, sweet bird lying there, sort of just sort of transcending, uh, uh, passing on, um, is the current status we find ourselves in, in terms of, uh, you know, the earth and what we're doing to it. So those are my concerns. Um, and I just, I think what's interesting is just that the, the scale of it is important. And the, um, the fact that it has this, just this regal disposition, you know, and it's lying there. And it is the, <clears throat> again, like the look time, it's, it's the humble still life on the bottom rung of the, of the painting um, hierarchy. And yet this is the one that I think is most impactful in terms of, you know, as a still life evoking these bigger themes. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about these works. Um, you know, the next one, I, I was reminded, I have a, I have a, a piece here that, that is also, I think, quite relevant, if you'll indulge me. But when, when um, Lorette was talking, I was, and I grabbed the, the Rilke from next to my bed because I was reading it. And this has been on the, at the back of my mind and at the forefront of my mind, I suppose, as well. But he articulates it beautifully. He says, for we are only the rind and the leaf, the great death that each of us carries inside is the fruit. Everything enfolds it. And in a way, that's, that's the bottom line. That's the thing that the sublime will evoke a sense of terror. Effectively, that terror is the fact that we are mortal. And, and we're looking for something transcendent. And there's things around us that are dying all the time. And we're being reminded of that essential truth. Now, that's, that's sort of been my approach with these paintings. And the, the, if I can say one last thing about the, the last painting or the other painting on the show, which was this little dove. And he was, he was at, on the balcony of my studio, which is in Fordsburg in Johannesburg. There's hundreds of pigeons there. They are just dreadful. I hate them, uh, you know, they, you, you, you know, whatever you may think. But anyway, this little fellow lay there and just died in front of my eyes. He sort of lay there and then he turned on his back and he was, it was like I was, and his eyes were open or her eyes were open and I witnessed the, the closing of the eyes as it were. So there was that moment of the passing of this, this, this little beast. Um, and that, you know, can one paint that? Is it even worthwhile? Because the experience was quite profound. You know, these beasts that I've come to really dislike because of their um, ubiquitousness, but, but uh, you know, watching it die and then being reminded of this very thing, this fruit that I carry within me as a conscious sentient being that this too shall pass. Um, and that's my relationship, I think, um, with, with the sublime is really that this too shall pass, you know, and what will we do with our time here and what are we doing and um, what is the painter's duty in the face of this impending crisis? So those are questions I, that I have circulating in my life and in the studio um, and have set up and the series is, um, and I'm very pleased that they saw the light of day in such good company because these works have been sitting in the studio and uh, have been waiting to be shown. And uh, the series is not complete yet, but I was very pleased with this, this invitation to um, have them breathe their first public uh, life in, in this way. Um, so Thank you. Thank I don't you know so if much. that answers anything. <laughs> I did, it was actually really um, enriched my understanding uh, of your work. Um, one of the things that I was really hit by is the luminous, the luminosity, the light that was, and in a way it's like you painted the void more than the object. The, the bird gets a lot of detail, but it's really about that void. And um, so, you know, and I, and I think that that sense of death that is constantly present with us um, is what comes through. 
Um, I want to pick up that sense of, 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 of emptiness and silence and um, thank you, Harman. Um, and I want to, to link it to, to the object, um, which really is about this self-preservation that we have and um, the, the link to death and that, but in a way that enforces the living moment, um, you know, that, that we are trying to make something clear that is unclear, that is uh, invisible, like your dove and that moment of transcendence, if you will, or, or life passing from one to the other. Lorette, do you want to maybe add something here about the the object and um, say a bit more about what, what object is uh, as an idea? Uh, yes, absolutely, Gwen. Um, essentially, the object is when the sublime meets horror, it evokes a deep-seated fear, a dread of the uncomprehendable and the uncanny. Um, the viewer cannot help but feel enthralled by the abject. I'm thinking of the French feminist philosopher, Julia Kristeva, who did a lot of work on the abject, and she said, um, well, basically, the concept of becoming corpse as the ultimate abjection, the, the sense of me leaving my body behind it corresponds to Burke's philosophical inquiry into the sublime that we've just looked at in that the sublime essentially evokes overwhelming feelings of dread and melancholy in its terrifying infinity it's that kind of thing the sea that Herman re referred to um, you know the infinity of death the unknown not knowing what is to come and um, the way it ties into this exhibition, as I mentioned earlier, they, they emerged a kind of two very definite groups where we had the abject dealing with the dystopian context in the works behind me. Um, it mixes with a, a nice dose of gallows humor. Um, it's part of the human condition to make light of serious matters, even the Dutch and Flemish Renaissance painters like Bosch and Bruegel that I mentioned earlier. In their work, they, there's always that dark sense of humor. So the work of Judy Woodbourne and Han Lee Tout and Marlies all show that making light of death is entirely acceptable in the correct context. Um, but more than this, the realization that life is fragile and that the boundary between life and death is porous and that we are constantly pushing up against that boundary is what makes this pandemic so utterly terrifying. Um, I think, think that we, once we've left the security of the mundane and we've ventured through the infinity of the sublime, then we find ourselves in the abject. Um, and we realize that the boundaries between these three th themes are extremely porous. And that's what keeps us alive, you know, pushing up against these boundaries. Uh, the abjects abject address that most porous of boundaries in that it keeps, um, if we look at the skin as a metaphor for that boundary, it keeps that which keeps us alive, the viscera, the, the guts and the gore, it keeps that inside. And when the boundary of the skin is ruptured, that's when death essentially sets in. Um, essentially, the only thing that lies between us and death figuratively is our skin. Uh, Christeva says that which I permanently have to thrust aside in order to stay alive. And to me, um, I'm, you are going to be discussing your work, so I just want to touch a bit on Tian's work. Tian's work deals with life amongst those who succumb to drug abuse. Um, and it doesn't only engage with the abject on the literal level of drug abuse being an abject theme, but it speaks to that abjection on a more symbolic level as the puncturing of the skin. Um, the skin thus becomes a metaphor for the boundary between life and death. Thank you. That, um, yeah, that also brings up uh, the sense of tension and ambiguity one sees within these works. Um, and that the artists, you know, that we as artists continually try and make evidence some, something that's that's obscure. Um, I think one of the one of the that that we as artists often utilize to translate 
these quite heavy, dense philosophical understandings, which we are grappling with, and art is a kind of philosophy, um, it is through our medium. And uh, I mean, one of the artists that, that I want to give over to is, is Monique, who works with uh, a great sense of, of abstraction um, in, in your attempt to, to in, in the way I see it, um, to understand these ambiguous in between layers of what makes sense in this moment, um, to, to search for a melancholy, to search for a, a place. I see that also, Monique, in, in when I spoke to you the other day, the, the sense of your site where you live. So if you can um, give us a bit of, of, of background about uh, you know, how do you interpret your, your sense of place and how you use your, your abstraction to think about these themes, Monique? Hi, um, hi everyone. Um, I, I'm very interested in, generally speaking, in how one's environment um, impacts on what one does in terms of making art. And um, I live in Preble Bay, and uh, of course I live in one of the richest um, uh, fauna and flora kingdoms um, in the world. Um, and um, so I use that in my work. I um, use tea bags <laughs> a, a lot. And for me, um, you, as my substrate, so for me that um, it gives me a sense of, of uh, connection. And uh, of course, during lockdown, we were really um, wanting to keep the, the connections of of uh, friends, family, um, without being able to, um, to to do that, and uh, so using the the um, tea bags and then printing on the tea bags uh, with plants that I'd collected from my immediate environment, um, sort of brought the two concepts together because I think that um, where we live. Um, and, and our interactions with those around us has a huge impact on the type of art um, and the response to, to art that, that uh, we, we have. Um, Warren, if you'd like to just show my funny little pictures. <laughs> the only things I ever iron are tea bags. Um, so th this is my piece, which is a really small piece. It's, it's 20 by 20 uh, centimeters. And um, it, it, to me, the themes that Lorette has um, uh, used are very, very interlinked. So I've used a very mundane um, substrate, the tea bags that I've been talking about, um, and um, from a psychological, um, thought-provoking point of view, I've used um, the, the uh, elements in my environment, which um, really inform everything that uh, I do. But this piece is perhaps on a more visceral level, where uh, it's called All Zoomed Out, and um, the tea bags in, in this particular instance were really us in our own little boxes trying to make connections. So I've used the mundane elements of, of tea bags and thread. The thread um, is what connects the pieces, but it, it also holds attention. Um, and um, I think that. Um, with, within um, the, the, what we were all trying to do in our own little boxes and trying to connect on Zoom and whatever other social media we had at hand, um, we, were, we came together, but we were also behind the screen and still very much apart. Um, so I think what I'm trying to say is that um, the, the thread here is what, um, holds the, the thing together, um, but it's also evocative of the tensions that we feel in our own little boxes, the family tensions and the interactions with, um, with um, our own small homes. 
Um, and uh, Warren, if you want to go over on to the next slide. The, um, so tea bags, as I say, I, I collect them from friends. Um, I use my own tea bags. So for me, it's very much um, a um, collection and a, um, it, it's a social connection. That's, that's really what they mean uh, to me because we all are, are very, we all drink tea, I think, at some point, and um, it, it, it um, is that social connection. Uh, and the next slide, Warren. So what I do with the tea bags is I print on them, as I said, with um, the foraged plants that I find in, in my environment. So I use um, the leaf that I'm holding there is from a kid worm, uh, which are actually in flower at the moment, but weren't um, at the time. And if you could go back to the piece, Warren. Um, great, thanks very much. Um, so in, in this piece, um, there's quite a lot of symbolism there. There is um, crosses, which um, sort of are an element of, of how we view death. We use a cross as a, as a um, symbol of that. Um, and um, the zigzag lines, the ups and downs of how life um, was that or, and always is, um, and the crossing of lines, the interactions. So full of symbolism, um, the boxes are really um, the little boxes that we put ourselves in and that we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, I think that something that, for me um, comes through is how with all these interactions and non-interactions, um, our own mortality um, has come very much more into view and um, how we've had to think about death um, on a much more practical um, level. But if we take a step back and a, a deep breath, there is a great tenderness um, uh, in dying and uh, perhaps links back to what Herman was saying about watching the bird die, is that if we just take a breath, it, it is part of um, life and, and the interactions in our lives. It's not something that happens elsewhere or out there or wherever. It, it's part of who we are. And uh, we, we need to make, make peace with it. So, yeah, thank you, Gwen. <laughs> thank you very much, Monique. I, I, I see so many links as well, although your work aesthetically is so different, but with Warren's work and um, that notion of a, a certain absence that one sees in your shadow figures, um, and that impossibility also to really, like you say, we're striving to connect, but we, we remain absent. I mean, even in, in, in this webinar, um, what cements this webinar the most is the fact that we are, I'm sitting in Pretoria and you sitting on the other side and, and Lorette. And, uh, so each of us and, and every listener that's sitting here is also so that um, that the tension between absence and attempting to connect but absolutely um, so, so thank you very much for that i think um i want to link that again back to 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 uh, my favorite philosopher Braidotti, that speaks about how um there is in a time of anthropocene also a certain post anthropocene where we where we talk about the affirmation of life and death being an affirmation of life, of something that is abstract being an affirmation of that which is here. Um, and and the the sense of um, of of that every day we leave behind that day, but that also makes us realize we really have to hang on to every moment where we are present. Um, I I want to use this opportunity just to. Uh, uh, briefly reflect on um, the the absence that I worked with in in my works. Um, 
let me just get that on the screen. So, uh, Lorette, you refer to um, the, the, the triptych. Um, you see that on my, no, not yet, sorry. <laughs> just get the screen sharing on. I want to just share again uh, this image. Um, okay, is it visible to you? It is the three photographs that I took um, that was uh, part of my own um, life death uh, situation. I, I lost my husband last year. And uh, being what was for me tangible, sitting in the hospital and, and spending a lot of time, um, was the objects that surround me. Um, so we'll just look at this, for example. This is uh, one of the intravenous drip bags. And what really struck me in the situation we, you know, we are obviously just surrounded, but uh, immense sadness and trauma is how the liquid of and the things around us not only changes physically the view of the landscape and the things outside there, but that the presence of all the material that's surrounding us change the way we see life. Um, the way that I view my personal circumstance, my, my life, and, and, and a lot of values that I had significantly shifted through this experience. So this, these three photographs um, of reservoir, this being, as I said, after the drip, and my photograph of was cropped uh, in this presentation, but it felt very painterly. And being a painter, that really resonated with me. Um, the other image uh, was of uh, of the uh, what is the kidney bag the I've got the word now but what 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 really struck me was if you zoom into it um, the sense of a world of particles and how we are completely monitored in every aspect by the readings on computers. So the technological um, dependence on what the doctor would also say, um, it's continually measured. Um, there is no uh, understanding of um, what, or there isn't the real consideration of what, what people are necessarily feeling on the one side, but there is the measurement, the continuous measurement through um, through the different readings. Um, in in this particular photograph, I was struck when looking at at this at how it feels like a body. It's just a piece of technology plastic, but it really felt like um, heart, lungs, uh, and something liquid. So it it links with the um, idea of the object that um, how poor is, is our existence in um, and how we are measured. Um, it becomes in death that you don't even watch somebody as a person dying, but you watch the monitor and how the beat of a heart goes slower. So um, our complete dominance by algorithms and technology um, as a substance, as, as how we experience. So these works um, have a very abstract feel to it. Um, the other work that I have on the exhibition also tries to make sense of the moment of death in the sense that um, it is about the bed sheets. Um, it is about the UV pipes, all the, the hundreds of drips linked to, to, to a person in that moment, and how we experience that as uh, incredible serene moment. Um, I, you know, if, I think before one has experienced something like that, it's um, like Herman was speaking about the dove. Uh, it, it strikes you very deep and very intense as to how different it is than what you expected. Um, and how one's view shifts um, in that moment of, of understanding trauma. So my works try here to, to capture a, a certain serenity. Um, the play of mundane stuff like just the texture of sheets, um, but how that becomes 
for me reflect of 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 a baroque painting where the excess of everything comes together and falls away so that was uh what i experienced in in this particular um uh, images uh, in these particular images um at this stage um i think that is all i'm going to say about my own work um let me just get back to my screen <laughs> sorry um have i stopped sharing yes <laughs> so um what is for me um significant in these works is that um this sort of life providing containers um as in drips or sheets and medical equipment our artworks is also a bit like that they become um life containing providers they become objects that tries to talk about something that is not possible Aaron was talking about Kiefer and Kiefer's um, acknowledgement that his work uh, accredits or acknowledges that which is impossible it actually speaks about the impossibility to to render that which is horrific that which is um, unbearable so the the image just creates a sense of that but it also it also brings in a sense of um uh, as i said the mundane the very simple acts it is however we think of this as something great and and about all and it is really um in the mundane ordinariness ordinariness of material of molecules of substance um that we find some kind of link some kind of connection um and with this in mind um if we talk about the the mundane um i am not going to say too much about it because uh, lorette you've said quite a bit about the the mundane um i would like um uh, adi to to speak a bit about her work adi and how your work were really sort of a, a kind of the enchantment of of things that is mundane mm. uh thank you gwen i'm just going to uh, share my screen so let me know if it's all up it is yeah okay wonderful uh so uh, just bear with me i'm going to just read something that i i wrote a little while ago it just basically says uh as an introduction to who i am i grew up in the winelands but it could have been in the noordkap or in balloy or in kalmore anywhere where people live who belong to the vgk and i thought for a long while should i now tell you what the vgk is but um i i decided i will so basically in apartheid the dutch reform church was split into three parts in a very traumatic fashion and those parts were classified as the white the colored and the black church and the vgk is um the colored section then of of that institution when i was little i must have thought that adults prayed with their feet because that's mostly what i remember seeing when we huddled together in people's homes for wednesday night with their shoes and bibles and the light bulb flickering in a back room those were sacred spaces but also charged and segregated spaces with our family the only one out of place but we were made to feel at home quite literally in my experience the texture of the carpet and the soft scuffling of feet becoming one with the muted sounds of prayers for children with addictions porcelain and plastic flowers the most colorful of decor calendars and bible verses the paintings on the wall and as we sang kuetis like he never failed me yet dogs were barking in streets that were too dangerous to walk at night ordinary people ordinary places but very strange and hard to articulate um that's when i that's what i see when i think of the mundane domestic interiors but also institutional interiors like schools and churches um when you grow up in church you know there's a lot more happening than simply a few hours on a sunday 
Um, someone has to lock up for the funeral. Someone has to sweep the corners dirty before a wedding. Someone has to photocopy the flyers and put water in the duop font where baptisms take place. Someone has to answer the phone and type out the minutes. It's a place of the mundane, of work, of meetings, and arrangements. Uh, this is the work that I have as part of the mundane section. Um, the church was our family's nine to five. But of course, it's also the place of the sublime. The awe inspired by high ceilings and tinted windows of 900 people of voices blending in harmonic harmony of transcendence of otherness and of the unknown. Um, the one church painting I did was part of the sublime section. Um, here's another one, which also depicts the, the actual church building. Um, at the moment, oh, this is a, a school painting I did a while ago of Iras Valet. At the moment, I'm reading quite a lot about uh, Protestantism and the arts, um, which I think is a very interesting and a rich field. Uh, but a few years ago, also uh, missions and colonialism was really part of my interest, and that also informed my master's thesis. So, you know, growing up in this religious environment, like how does politics and uh, institution and religion and education all, all mix it up into this interesting, very ambiguous melting pot of and, and race, of course. Um, so I guess that there's all uh, things I try to grapple with in my work. Um, I guess I'm, yeah, so, so apart from just uh, all the interesting um, conceptual things, I guess, behind the work, I'm very much drawn to the practical side. I think like Monique also said, um, here's some, I don't have great uh, process shots, but here's some of them. I basically paint to wherever I can, often on the floor, and uh, there's absolutely no rules. So I use um, stenciling quite a lot and masking tape. I'm very super like messy and um, haphazard. So or sometimes the work also doesn't go where you want it to go. Um, sometimes I work, I usually work in, in quite a few layers. And then the gesso boards I use um, that I make, it allows you to really scratch into the surface of, of the work. So um, I, I, I'm not a very patient painter necessarily, I think, but I try to work on the works much longer than is actually necessary, because I think that really mimics the way that um, material deteriorates, um, the patina or the veneer, uh, that historical knowledge uh, or that, that um, history um, affects on our material world. I think that's really fascinating. So yeah, I love painting wood and metal and plastic, concrete. Um, no, I use glazing, I paint with my hands or with lapis or anything that I've got. Uh, and then just in terms of realism, I really believe that the, the painting um, process or the, there's something inherent in painting that is different from photography. Um, and I, I believe that there's, uh, it's more than just a representation. Um, yeah, anyway, so these are some of my works. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Adi. Um, I find, uh, once again, the sense of absence within the works. Um, you talk about, uh, um, you talk about a certain experience within the uh, a, a very specific time but um, there's a lot of painful experience for a lot of people within that time and and your work evoke also the gap in that experience as much as it talks about um, all these layered uh, association you know we have it being at home um, the it as much recall the sense of so many people being absent and the trauma that is experienced in our country in general. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm interested to see how your work will develop. Um, I've really enjoyed um, everybody's comments here. And I would like to know if, before I give over to, to Lorette to 
presenters of the conclusion. We it is uh, past twelve already. Um, if there isn't uh, a comment from from one of our uh, Herman or Monique um, or Heidi, your last comment from your side, and then um, Lorette can wrap up for us. Yes, I'd just like to say thank you to Lorette um, for pulling this all together because it really is a very special exhibition and I think um, it's given many artists um, a, a, a place to put the work that they, that they made during a really difficult um, time and um, to make the connections that we were not able to make um, during, during lockdown. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful exhibition and very thought provoking. So thank you very much. Thank you, Monique. <laughs> I'm also just very, um, thank you for this webinar. I think it's so great for us to be able to connect especially the Cape and the Gauteng artists, we don't often see each other or are part of the same shows. So yeah, it's great to hear from Herman and to Monique's in the Cape, but yeah, it's great. Thanks Gwen also for, for facilitating. Mm. Thank you. Herman, a last word from you? Yeah, I also just want to echo that um, gratitude for the courage to take these kind of themes on and, and articulate them and then show them. Uh, I think it does take a, a certain, well, a certain purpose uh, and vision and you've embodied it and you've taken it on and you've shown these works. And so congratulations and thank you. I think that's, that's what I have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I just muted myself in the process. Um, <laughs> I wanted to post uh, just a note on our comments that the session will be available. Red, uh, can you give us some last, um, uh, uh, last conclusive um, comments uh, for the session? Yes, I will. Thank you, Gwen. I just want to say thank you to all the participating artists, because no matter how big the idea might be, it would be nothing without you guys showing your beautiful work. And um, whereas this exhibition was initially, the vision for the exhibition was initially to delve into the human psyche to unearth how we search for connection, um, especially when social distance is imposed upon society. It was a psychological search before it became a visual quest. Um, so just briefly, things that emerged as I was putting the exhibition together, um, what happened was as artists started submitting work, I found that these themes, which had initially been very separate in my mind, overlapped and intermingled, and it became this beautiful organic process that was completely unplanned, um, which just serves to emphasize for me how porous the boundaries are between the sublime, the abject, and the mundane. And then what also became apparent later was that so many of these motives manifested in the artist's works long before COVID made its appearance in March. So I can, uh, we can extrapolate that these are themes that have always been below the surface of society and that the pandemic just kind of acted like a catalyst for these things to come forward. Um, Lastly, just conceptually on the way it was put together, it was important for me conceptually that the work in the mundane series be grouped close together to evoke a kind of claustrophobia with the viewer. And then um, as it ran from the mundane into sublime, the work would be spaced further and further apart, where it then came to this wall behind me, which kind of deals with a quirky, you know, the dark humor. So it's got a completely asymmetrical installation. And then as it flows from there into the more serious mundane work, the spacing becomes further apart yet again to evoke a sense of quietness. Um, and yeah, also it was, it was installed 
in part um, on the assumption that people would read a room from left to right in a circular fashion. But at the same time, it works equally well if one were to come from the other side. Um, that, that is about it, exploring the, the porous boundaries between these themes. I've come to realize that life is essentially a dance on the precipice between the mundane, the sublime and the abject. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and congratulations again uh, to you, Lorette. I'm looking forward to having you as a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just for the audience, um, thank you for the artist. Um, I know that this forum is new to a lot of you. Um, for, for many of us, it's new. Um, for the audience, this exhibition is, is opened already and will run to the 4th of December. If you can visit the exhibition, there's nothing like uh, viewing the works in situ and understanding the tactility of the works itself. Thank you, everybody, for this, and um, goodbye.